So we're going to move on in a second. It's all downhill from now. So uh, anyway, but you know, like good downhill racers, we'll uh, we'll we'll navigate the uh, the slopes. Thank you so much, Cornell. Uh, absolutely beautiful, and he really speaks again uh, so passionately and so directly to the singularity. This term that we really need to re re recapture for some of our best and and. Uh, most caring and uh, fundamentally, um, if you will, revolutionary minds of the of the uh, of the twentieth century and going into the twenty first century. Uh, you know, we're we're in the presence of the real deal, Stanley's thought, and today we hope we will live up to the expectations that he may have of us. And you know, this is really about everything from influence to friendship, and of course to the legacy. And this is what we hope to do today, uh, moving forward. So I, I'm I'm going to move on to the first panel. So we because lunch is arriving uh, in about an hour and and, and ten minutes. So um, I'm going to move over on to the first panel, which is literature and social knowledge. Uh, it's taken from a, a title, a literature as social knowledge, a, a piece that Stanley wrote in Dead Artists Live Theories on the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, in which he tried to situate literature as part of the social sciences, how to study literature, you know, with all uh, due respect to Lucian Goldman's sociology of literature, I think it was a major advance on, on uh, Goldman's uh, earlier piece, the famous Romanian uh, Parisian intellectual. So I, I want to invite up uh, Michael Denning, who is here, Andrew Long, uh, who I think will be facilitate uh, the uh, the panel um, and uh, Sonia Sayers, and we're joined from Rome. And, and thank you so much again with Barbara Foley. She'll be on Zoom. She's in Rome uh, as a retired professor, but she's still working hard on uh, literature as social knowledge. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to uh, Andrew Long, who's going to facilitate this panel. Okay, thank you. In addition to all the thanks that uh, have been made so far, actually, would, I would just like to say that I know Michael has worked on this this uh, symposium, this seminar tirelessly, and uh, it wouldn't have happened without him, you know, uh, and Peter. I, I guess I talk to I talk to Michael all the time, so I mean that's where I hear I hear it from, um, and also uh, following on the some of the comments from Dr. West and from uh, uh, Peter. Uh, couple of things that Stanley used to always tell me. Uh, one is uh, the left has to have conviviality. And so when I showed up and Michael was outside on the curb with, uh, well, stacks of beverages, I did note that the balance between wine and, and uh, water was 50%. So there we go. <laughs> it's, it's barely noon. <laughs> and uh, the other thing, since I'm going to read a text, is he always told me, you know, Andrew, I won't do my imitation of him. Uh, Andrew, uh, you know, if you ever want to get anywhere, you, you can't read a text, you know, you can't go up there. You have to be able to, well, as Dr. West just demonstrated, uh, you have to be able to, you know, you know, you know, talk off the cuff and, uh, you know, go with where the crowd is. Um, I, I failed miserably. <laughs> and I became one of those academics, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I... I would like to welcome uh, here today in our presence, uh, Professor Michael Denning and Professor Sonia Sayers, and again from Rome, uh, Professor Barbara Foley. Uh, first, I wanna say that uh, when Michael, Michael Pelius, my close friend and longtime fellow member of the Grad Center Cultural Studies Critique of Everyday Life Study Group, which was a study group which Stanley was a part of actually, we met several times in his Union Street uh, apartment back in the day asked me to chair a panel for this gathering on literature as social knowledge, I knew exactly what he meant. My recognition of this phrase was due to my own time working with Stanley and the shared vocabulary of our group, such as our, well, the group we had, and his love for fiction and novels such as Last Exit to Brooklyn, which he pro proclaimed one of the best novels about class in America, along with Saturday Night Fever, which he told me was the best film about class. And I remember I looked at him, I did double take. He would say remarkable things sometime, but that one really had me uh, spinning my head. But he was right. I watched it recently with my daughter and was really struck at, well, all the misinterpretations of that film and what a strong film it is about class in Brooklyn. Well, I scoffed at the latter, but I watched it again, as I said, and realized he, just how right he was. 
However, just to be sure that our panel was oriented, Michael suggested that, that we all take a look at chapter six of Stanley's Dead Artists Live Theories on the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, the chapter that Michael just referred to, published in 1984. And I would say this uh, on a personal note, notably four years after the CUNY administration squashed our attempt to form a PhD program in cultural studies, and later offered something called intercultural studies as a kind of identity-based palliative some three years after the successful 10-day CUNY-wide student strike. And my brother G. Ganter is here from those heady days of 1991. Um, uh, uh, the CUNY strike, which mobilized tens of thousands of young New Yorkers in a march from 42nd Street right here, all the way down to Wall Street. We actually made it. And there used to be a photograph, I wish I could find it, of us holding up our banner saying CUNY on strike and right dead across from Wall Street, it was a pretty remarkable moment. And they made damn sure that never happened again in 1996. They blocked us and ringed us in by, I don't know, six, six deep police from every agency around the area. Anyway, um, to that end, I'd like to share the following passage from that chapter. This is a long quote. It may be the age of appetites is over. We've experienced a massive assault on our own excessive moment, complete with regrets, self-renunciations, communitarian journeys cloaked in the garb of religious fundamentalism or of humanism, the left wing of neoconservative discourse. Humanism is just another kind of religion, the idea of progress more or less unimpeachable. Rationalism enjoys the status of holy writ, yet just as art often prefigures politics and everyday culture, we can speculate that the rediscovery of Bakhtin, which antedated Glasnost by 15 years, will mesh with a postmodern social theory that challenges the assumptions of the scientific technological age. Bakhtin is the, is the theorist, social theorist of difference, who, unlike Derrida and Foucault, gives top billing to, and this is very Stanley, historical agents and agency. For Bakhtin, there are no privileged protagonists, no final solutions, only a panoply of divergent voices which somehow make their own music. When I read this chapter, I thought back to the late 1980s and the CUNY faculty Bakhtin study group. Uh, I wasn't allowed since I was a grad student. Uh, and again, my own work with Stanley on my oral, oral presentation and then my dissertation, which he served as my co-advisor. He's really actually my primary advisor given that my main advisor uh, it's a long story, but he was no longer here. Um, I think that Sonia, uh, you were part of the Bakhtin group back in that time, yeah? So maybe she can speak to uh, what went on. <laughs> uh, I, any good anecdotes would be appreciated. Uh, well, back to the passage. What strikes me now is this mix of Lukash and Bakhtin. Not the, just the latter alone. Indeed, Lukács' essays on literature, especially his comments on Balzac's novels, figure largely in the chapter from Dead Artist Live Theories. I know how much Lukács as a literary commentator meant to Stanley's thinking and, and, and work, as one of my two oral exams in comparative literature here at the Grad Center was on commitment or and or the literature of engagement that was engagé, that is the pairing and contrast of Lukács and Sass. I think the appeal of Bakhtin for Stanley beyond Lukács is evident in the passage I just quoted. That is the music of life, that panoply of voices, living, breathing, excessive subjects, a music in prose, but a music which appeals both intellectually and at a sentient level, that is everyday life. With my dissertation, I pushed Stanley just a bit further as I, uh, as I wrote about modern novel and conspiracy narratives as, as a form of social knowledge. It was thanks to him that actually that formulation came up. Again, conspiracy as a form of social knowledge. Uh, social knowledge, albeit flawed, and in most cases reprehensible uh, and bigoted. As Michael Pelias here once told me about Stanley, Stanley's a man of enlightenment and rationality, and this sort of disturbed thinking, especially the associated politics, were unacceptable him, to him. Yet we had great discussions about uh, the strike and the strikers and working class politics and consciousness in Zola's Germinal and the abjection and obeisance to power of Kafka's Ka in the castle. For today, to tell us more about literature and social knowledge, we have three distinguished panelists, Sonia Sayers, as I've said, Barbara Foley and Michael Denning. I'll introduce each of them in turn and we'll hold questions until the conclusion of the final presentation. Uh, again, we'll start with Sonia and I, I have a, just a little quick bio uh, on my phone. <laughs> I'm sorry about this.
Okay. Uh, Sonia came to New York City in 1981, uh, just as Stanley and John Brinkman were creating a social text. Uh, she, she at that time was hanging out with the Marxist phenomenologist Paul Picconi, that's how he pronounced his name, right? Yeah. Uh, and Sylvia Federici. Uh, I was actually, I have her book was Caliban, the Witch. Yeah, yeah, semiotext. Um, uh, just as they were created, Telos, some of you will know well. Uh, Stanley's and Fred Jameson's project pulled me strongly to accept the challenge of seeing that totality. Sonia is a professor, associate professor of interdisciplinary humanities at Cooper Union uh, here, right just down the road. And uh, please welcome Sonia Sayers. Um, when this question was posed to me, I must say I still think to myself, oh, um, that is a magic question that all the journalists are socializing and really keeping us exploring through the various uh, lights that have been thrown on to these questions. Um, and I had an idea about this question. I think it's idea that I start with this list, um, which was circulating among uh, social scientists and brain theorists and commentators on the status of humanity and what it's like. And it's a list about I mean, four or five hundred lines um, that expresses our humanity as you know, in uh, an object way and to the social imagination and the literary imagination might be. I thought, okay, that is probably what I can see a little bit outside of the framing of space from Edmund Lester. And then it seemed to explain this. Um, that that planet, that um, that sudden of thought um, to the point where we could just dive into this whole depth of history. And the question is the question of our own knowledge, our own knowledge of that and our history. I thought it was wrong. I thought it was wrong. So I got an idea. And I began to think about the nature of our own history. Probably remember this, the latent capacity of the um, And again, with my incredible capacity to be bigger at creating these readings, I had my own way of misinterpreting it. Um, Peace was then in the, in the cusp of um, the power of the new science and the beginning of sociological imagination to run logic into his world, the world of aesthetics. Um, and to which he was very much offended and many of his generation stood up, we now call them romantics, and um, set about um, pushing that outside of the protection of art, right? Art had to be protected for its power of imagination to go to the Grecian urn, to go, to bring back to life things that were dead, um, to embrace beauty as, as a powerful, powerful form. My creativeness reading um, when I was thinking about Shakespeare, um, because I think he's a man of mind um, and a powerful intellect of his own, um, was that capacity just to go, um, to go to the young lovers on a balcony in an impossible world and make it real to us. At the same time, go to Anthony and Cleopatra's arms where their love mature, whole empires fell. I mean, it was a capacity to go anywhere with that light of, of elegance and understanding and searching, you call it synoptic. Uh, if he wanted to strike dead the great profundity of the world, the great generative, you know, with Lear in this most bitterest of moments, nevertheless, he gave Lear the right words. Remember some of those words? In a moment of chaotic reflection, Lear stands there and says, arm sin with gold and the strong arm of lance, so the strong lance of the of the law hurtless breaks. Arm it in rags, a pygmy straw should break it. That fundamental injustice and Lear in a moment of Semi-clarity says, I took too little care of this. And he was about ready to you know, beat nature to the core. This is a negative capacity for me to make that moment so real 
so indelible. Um, I thought about the way, because Spock Teen, and it has been invoked for us today to think, you know, organize our thinking around that essay, um, Spock Teen, sense of language, the heteroglossia to which most people remember, it seems now to us, those who study novels, to be a you know, fundamental turn in the understanding of the amoral novel, because it brings in all those voices. But I was surprised that that essay had forgotten the carnivalesque. Because Bakhtin had resurrected the, the um, reputation of a very difficult writer, Rabelais, and about a world that um, is almost offensive. It is offensive. He writes only about offensiveness. And then brought it back into a fundamental social structure called the, the, the carnival, where offense was the story of the carnival and how underneath that carnival you could play out into a world of, of, of rebellion and chants and even secret organizations, right? There was in that Bakhtin moment, this wonderful feeling for um, the people's need to speak, to act even under oppressive terms. Um, so where am I going with this? Um, I thought about a moment in, in um, if you're Shakespearean or you love Shakespeare, you would remember it. This is um, when Prince Hal is sitting in the, this theater called the Tavern, and he's so just, you know, he's so alienated from his father's world and the corruption of it and the lies of it, the murderousness, the assassinations, the civil war. And he's living in a tavern, you know, robbing his own father's his check here. <laughs> you can see what he's doing. But listening to everybody, including the little, uh, indentured servant who has to run around with all the ale, the drawer, who then gives Hal a penny's worth of sugar to bribe him. And the young prince is sitting there thinking about this man's life, but he focuses on his language and he says, who is this child? The only words in his mouth are anon, I'm coming. Right? That's all he can grasp. And yet he's prepared and wishes some kind of freedom Hal says to him, do you want the end of your indenture? Is that what that penny's worth of sugar is for? But I got thinking again about this aesthetic um, and that sense of what literature does. Um, and what Keats was preserving, of course, was beauty. Right? He didn't want the intellect to attack beauty. Um, which brings me back to the time when Plato was forcing himself to think about this big question with his symposium. The symposium is elegiac. Everyone is already dead. Um, it happened, as you know, from its introduction through a discourse that was remembered by somebody else who remembered something else about this funny moment when Socrates couldn't even find the house. Right? He's wandering out next door in the wrong portico. <laughs> it's comic. It's elegiac. Um, and they're all drunk at the end. Only Socrates remembers to stay awake for this wonderful moment. Um, but by the time the Republic comes along, a sterner Plato is looking at that problem of narrative. And he's looking at that problem of representation with a stronger, stronger sense. And you will hear quoted forever the allegory of the cave, which pretty much summarizes his problems with representation. We are living in our puppet theater. We are writing the scripts to that public theater. So in my little thoughts this morning, I went on about beauty. Of course, who, wasn't, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, but I got back to the question of representation and Lukash, of course. Um, it's that story of the totality. So my thoughts today were something about that problem of negative, uh, negative capacity, which I see as this moving force into the synopsis, it, into the whole, not letting anything stay uncovered, silence not even that little drawer in the tavern. His silence provokes something in Prince Hal. Um, and that's that negative capacity. It just keeps moving. It won't tolerate stereotypes, conventions. Um, it accepts the alienation of our lives and keeps moving. And of course, this is what I see in Stan and what called, and, you know, why he was such a mover and shaker. Every time he showed up, things were going to happen okay? every single time. It was so wonderful. Now I have this problem with the totality. Uh, and I have to admit, I haven't been able to 
capture it because it's uncapturable. But I do know that as soon as you get into metaphysical thinking of any kind, it's right there. It's always already there. It's this longing to see more completely, to assume that what you cannot see, to be outside the cave and the puppet theater, it's already, already there. But what could it possibly mean in the present? And here I'll just, I'll just stop for a moment and wander lust around this new sunshine of the present that we're, we're trying to grasp. And a couple of very significant things just popped into my head. Um, you know, the TikTok phenomenon, right? Just, just that one thing alone about representation. Um, you could, in fact, spend your life, well, a long time trying to parse its power over this generation to be seen by millions at the same time to be used. I remember a law that's very important to me that every technological change will be a weapon against you because there is a, you know, a negation, a contradiction, which I learned a lot from Kalushkash and others, um, in everything we do. And I think Stan really had that at the source of his thinking. He understood that contradiction. He understood it would be there. The um, essay that I was going to play off on was actually uh, Heidegger's The Age of the World Picture, part more 1938, it's been almost 100 years, um, where he begins to think about what modernity will be, and it will be a picture. And here we are so choked to death by this world of being pictured to us. And he says, the key problem to the picture is you in the picture. Um, and that knowing that by taking a picture, you have objectified the world and how do you place yourself in the picture? As, uh, you know, as not as something already there because the totality requires a certain kind of mentality. I don't know where I'm going with this. I really ask your help. <laughs> um, but, but then just other things come to mind. I mean, just really wonderful occasions. Um, the scientists who discovered that in the deserts of the cold Arctic, you could find a shale that has been left there undisturbed since I've forgotten what age it was, but from the DNA caught in that shale, he can recreate a world, the animal life, the plant life, because the DNA, as we sit here in the room, is being shared. That breath of yours is the trace of the traceless, says Rumi, but um, now we're tracing it, tracing it back to an eon that has long gone and its proof of existence is before us. This is the age of the world picture. Um, Where's the absolute spirit? Well, Beethoven has his old to joy. Hey, hang on here. God lives beyond the stars. Think about what the stars mean to us right now. We're just rewriting the story of the, of the universe as we speak. You can't grasp that. So if there is this totality to which we long, with our negative capacity to keep filling in the picture, I see this contradiction, I don't have any resolve. But I see it there. And I do know that that world will in some way continually objectify your beingness in the world, your place in that picture. Um, and who but a great spirit with negative capacity could help us through this. That's my little speech. Mm. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Barbara Foley, and let me have a little blurb to share with you. Uh, Barbara is Emer uh, Emerita Distinguished Professor of English at Rutgers University, Newark. Newark's been invoked already today. Uh, 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 her scholarship has ranged over the fields of Marxist literary criticism, literary radicalism, and African-American literature. Her books include Radical Representation, Politics and Form in U.S. Proletarian Fiction, Wrestling with the Left, The Making of Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, and Marxist Literary Criticism Today. 
Barbara's a communist, a feminist, and an anti-racist. She came of age uh, politically with the SDS during the late 1960s and early 70s, and she served for many years as president of the Radical Caucus of the MLA and is currently vice president of the Marxist journal Science and Society. Please welcome Barbara Foley. Uh, she'll be here via Zoom. Oh, I was muted. <laughs> That'll do it. Can, can you uh, can you see me? Hear me now? Yep, you're good. Ready to go. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And thank thanks for piping me in from Rome and for doing the hybrid thing, which I know is is difficult. I, I really appreciate being here. Um, I heard two of my favorite words just mentioned: Newark and totality. <laughs> Uh, so I feel as if I'm among kindred spirits. Um, just about me and, and Stanley. Stanley and I must have been in the same room with, you know, those funny little chairs with a half desk on them uh, at Rethinking Marxism, Socialist Scholars Conference, Left Forum. Um, so we were in the same space many times, but I never, you know, really knew him personally very well. So it's it's very interesting to be, you know, exposed to you know, the impressions that people had of this formidable intellectual um, and how singular he was, and I would say probably still is, okay? I say these things not because he and I come from the same place on the left, we don't, but that's okay, right? We, we learn from each other. So uh, here I go, and uh, I'm gonna be talking about proletarian literature. Uh, one important feature of Stanley Aronowitz's legacy to us is, has been said already, the notion that literature constitutes a form of social knowledge. So whether, whether this is stated as literature and social knowledge or literature as social knowledge, uh, the phrase can signify a, a range of possibilities, right? Literature as knowledge of the social, the social as the site of literary cognition, the term constitutes not the ending, but the beginning of a conversation. Today, I'm gonna to be making a few observations about how a certain kind of knowledge of the social has historically enabled the production of a certain kind of literature, namely proletarian literature. And conversely, how this literature has contributed to our knowledge of the social. As I use the term, proletarian literature refers to a body of imaginative literature composed mostly during the 1930s and 1940s, when not just the capitalist crisis of the Great Depression, but also the energies and hopes released by the Bolshevik Revolution generated a class conscious literature focused on working class experience and written from the standpoint of, or at least strongly influenced by revolutionary Marxism. Unabashedly instrumentalist in its conception of art as in Mao Zedong's terms, a weapon in the class struggle, and he wasn't the only one who used that metaphor. This literature was conceived of uh, in a statement widely att attributed to Bertolt Brecht as not a mirror to reflect reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. So while proletarian literature was part of an international cultural project, my own work has focused on the body of text produced in the United States and it's associated with such names as, and I'm gonna give you a series of names here, which will be familiar, I'm sure to many of you, Mike Gold, Richard Wright, Langston Hughes, Tilly Olson, Clifford Odets, Grace Lumpkin, Mary Del de Seward, Dalton Trumbo, Carlos Bulosan, Pietro Di Donato, Ann Petrie, William Attaway, the young Ralph Ellison, Muriel Rukeyser, Saul Funeroff, the list goes on and on. U.S. proletarian literature was the subject of my 1993 book, which was just mentioned, titled Radical Representations, Politics and Form in U.S. Proletarian Literature, 1929 to 41. And I mentioned this book right in this context because Stanley wrote a blurb for the back cover. And this gesture was all the more generous because in the opening chapter, I registered some quite sharp disagreements with the political perspective and the descriptions of proletarian literature, in fact, informing his 1981 book, which has just been mentioned, The Crisis in Historical Materialism. And I think that that act of, of generosity seems to have been you know, typical of the kind of person that, that he was and is. 
I have been preoccupied with studying and teaching proletarian literature throughout much of my academic career and beyond. And while this body of literature has since its inception been subjected to critique and sometimes dismissed as propaganda, I have frequently been struck by the enthusiasm with which my students at Rutgers University Newark, largely coming from working class and multi-ethnic backgrounds, have heeded its critique of the world as well as, as, as it is, and its, its vision of how the world might be. Indeed, and despite, or perhaps because of, this literature's emergence from a historical moment quite different from our own, my students have found in this body of literature a source of social knowledge enabling them to challenge what they take for granted about the limits on their own lives. It's very timely literature. Students love Richard Wright, Uncle Tom's Children, Jews Without Money. This stuff is very contemporary and in feel. Time constraints compel me to summarize simply three of key features of this body of literature. First, works of proletarian literature generally aspire to a portrayal of the, here we go, social totality that stresses causal connections between and among the class structure of capitalist society, the individual behaviors and attitudes to which this gives rise, and the struggle of the working class, sometimes conscious, sometimes not, for liberation from the yoke of capital. Mediation, that is, attention to the multiplicity of these connections, is thus essential to a grasp of the social knowledge embedded in proletarian novels, poems, plays, etc. In Tilly Olson's Yonandio, which is a wonderful novel to teach, hands are not simply the source of the labor that lines the coffers of the bosses. Hands can nurture, they can push away, they can explore. They can be fists driven into the face. They can be fists raised in revolt. In Trombo's Johnny Got His Gun, another wonderful novel to teach, the horrifically wounded Joe Bonham achieves the proletarian internationalist realization that all soldiers must turn their guns around and engage in revolutionary defeatism. He can, do, he can see this only after he has pieced together and critically revisited the disconnect between his education and his experience. When Richard Wright calls upon black writers to draw connections between, here I quote, a woman hoeing cotton in the South and the men who loll in swivel chairs on Wall Street and take the fruits of her toil, unquote, he insists upon anti-capitalist class analysis as the framework within which to understand the relationship between the sharecropper and the banker a relationship that is, of course, also racialized and gendered. It's precisely because of their foregrounding of the fine web of these interconnections that most works of proletarian literature refute the charge that Marxism entails class reductionism, that term we hear so frequently these days, portraying the concrete totality shaping the lives of people who are differentially positioned within the matrix of exploitative class relations require, requires a grasp of social knowledge that extends down to the very capillaries of the lived body politic. Second, proletarian literature portrays a totality in motion. The possibility for revolutionary social transformation supplies writers with dialectical insights into the potentiality underlying apparent stasis. The reality of the Bolshevik revolution hovers in the background and sometimes the foreground of such works as Odette's Waiting for Lefty, Lumpkin's To Make My Bread, and Gold's Jews Without Money. Thus Wright calls upon writers to, here I quote him again, connect the life of a Negro living in New York's Harlem with the consciousness that one sixth of the earth's surface belongs to the working class. And of course, when I've taught this, this essay called Blueprint for Negro Writing, one sixth of the world's, world's earth's, earth's surface, what's that, huh? <laughs> the Soviet Union, right? Even in texts that like Unandio emphasize the material and, and ideological conditions that currently preclude movement toward revolution, there are glimpses of the not yet in the now, a wonderful phrase of Olson's a phrase that reminds us of Ernst Bloch's contrast between compensatory and anticipatory utopia. 
the latter term signifying, here I quote Block, the not yet conscious hope for the not yet become that has the potentiality to come into being. Works of proletarian literature generally avoid compensatory utopian formulations that postulate a kind of premature humanist universalism. That is the purview of liberalism or religion. But these texts of proletarian literature, they nonetheless draw their poetry from the future. I think here of the movement from I to we in Mary Del Lesseur's uh, essay, I Was Marching, and very famously in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. As the, polls, the, as the poet Saul Funeroff wrote, because he was, and here I'm quoting Funeroff in, in a wonderful, wonderful image and statement, because he was an exile from a future time, from shores of freedom I may never know, his task was, he wrote, to bring tidings from that future time that are sounding in the surf of the present. So proletarian literature for all its immersion in the painful present is thus bound to a futuristic version, vision, sorry. We are reminded of Lenin's 1902 observation to the revolutionary writer, Dmitry Pesarov, that revolutionary needs, revo revo excuse me, revolutionary movements need revolutionary dreaming. And that th this may sound a little anomalous coming from Lenin, but he said, of this kind of dreaming, there is unfortunately too little in our movement. Recognition of the harshness of what Frederick Jameson has called the history that hurts does not confine the writer to continual oscillation between the poles of antinomy. Nor, and here I just I gesture toward Stanley's you know, very interesting discussion of Bakhtin, nor is the writer confined to the representation of heteroglossia, polyphony, and dialogism, those important terms to Bakhtin's theory, even though these are surely signaled features of classic realism. As Stanley is the first to admit, dialogism is not the same thing as dialectics. In proletarian literature, the possibility for dialectical negation and sublation lurks behind the seeming logjam of the present with its proliferation of voices. Engaging with this dialectical potentiality starts with the realization that, as Brecht continually reminds us, things do not need to remain the way that they are now. In order for the proletariat to shake off the material chains by which it's bound, though, it must liberate itself from the chains of dominant ideology, what Gramsci called common sense, senso comune, comune. The widespread stereotype of proletarian literature as celebrating moments of conversion to Marxism, to communism, whatever, is thus largely inaccurate, at least as often irony dominates the rhetorical landscape. Unfashionable as the assertion may sound, even in these post-postmodernist days, I propose that this ironical self-criticism is premised upon a notion of ideology as false consciousness. Now this in turn is premised upon the third and final defining feature of proletarian literature, namely its realist epistemology. If the class struggle and the need for revolution constitute the truth underlying proletarian experience, then those who reject this truth or just remain impervious to it are not simply shooting themselves in the foot. They do not possess an objective understanding of the nature of the world. That the capitalists benefit from such mass misunderstanding goes without saying. Hughes in a poem titled An Open Letter to the South refers to the lies of race, I'm quoting here, that bind workers black and white alike to the time clock and the plow. Petrie, in a short story called Like a Winding Sheet, which is a terrific, terrific story to, to teach and to consider with students, shows how a black male worker's alienation from labor displaced onto his wife leads to domestic tragedy of the worst kind. And gold in Jews Without Money displays the pathos in the youthful protagonist's father being irretrievably convinced that it's bad luck, not capitalism. It's the reason why he is a Jew without money. And right in his grim judgment that Bigger Thomas of Native Son 
could as readily become a fascist as a communist shows the enormity of what is at stake for the left in reaching bigger on his, in his own terms and on his own terrain. But such an assessment can be valid only if in some sense, Bigger Thomas, along with his many analogs among the non-class conscious characters and voices animating texts of proletarian literature, that he has to be in some sense wrong, okay? That is ideology as lived is not simply a matter of discourses competing for legitimacy. It can be true, less true, or mainly false. The not yet in the now can achieve its negation and sublation if and only if revolutionary ideas once seized by the masses, that familiar phrase, become a material force. And while no single fictional character or poetic voice possesses the whole truth about what is to be done, as is surely borne out, borne out by the portrayal of the white communists in Native Son. This makes it all the more important for the text to guide its readers in piecing together key components of that truth. This revolutionary rejection of epistemological relativism is central to the kind of social knowledge that makes the legacy of proletarian literature so enduringly important for our time. So I'll leave things there. I wish Stanley were here so that we could talk about all of this. I'm sure he would have a lot to say, but then of course, in some sense, he is here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Uh, As part of the actually part of my orals uh, exam was uh, commitment or uh, engage or engagement, but yeah, Stanley actually did ask me to read a number of proletarian novels. He was very fond actually of Edward Dahlberg as a kind of a working class uh, pastoral uh, because I was flesh and other now obscure titles. Uh, mm -hmm. But he really liked Mike Gold. Uh, and, um, you know, in our dark moment, I think back, actually, I think it's the very, very end, and Barbara, of course, knows this cold, I'm sure, uh, where uh, the narrator, Mike Gold himself, emerges from a long personal despair. And, you know, I, I think about this often with regard to conspiracy narratives. And he says, uh, somewhere in the Lower East Side, I saw a man on, on top of some boxes and he was talking and he was talking about a Messiah. And that Messiah was working class consciousness, was not a person, you know. Um, and I think about that often, you know, I think about the foreclosure and the, the, the despair of our contemporary recourse to conspiracy narratives. Uh, somebody else who's, of course, uh, also very familiar with uh, this canon is uh, Michael Denning, whom I, as a very young person, crossed paths with, sort of, at Columbia when he taught a course on the WPA and 30s literature. Uh, he has, of course, since then written uh, many other books, one of which is my favorite, The Cultural Front. Um, and along with uh, Stanley and Sonia, he was a member of the Social Text Editorial Collective in the early 1980s. Uh, today, he teaches American studies at Yale. Uh, his books include Noise, Uprising, Culture in the Age of Three Worlds, of course, The Cultural Front, which I just mentioned. And uh, he's currently completing The Accumulation of Labor, which will be published by Verso. Please welcome Michael Denning. Wow. Two, uh... You know, I was thinking back and I almost, I can almost remember every time that I was ever alone together with Stanley, a couple weird lunches. For me, Stanley was always a group of people. We were at a bar together, we were in a room together, we were at a political meeting together. And so for me, man, Stanley was Sonia and Cornell, you know, it was those social text meetings, those wacky ones and Gene Franco. And well, I won't even go into all of those things. I think I was the youngest person. I always felt like the mascot we would drive down from. You imagine driving from New Haven with Cornell. I felt like I was kind of the walking bass while Cornell was doing these solos, you know, or, or maybe just the kid with a clave. They allowed him to keep the time and you hope that you were there. Uh, uh, it's 50 years since... False Promises, a book which when I first read it, I 
didn't understand everything I was reading. And when I went back to it, I thought, God, this is where it all came from. So I thought I wanted to talk a little bit about false promises as a proletarian novel. Uh, the local 33, the graduate teachers at Yale had an election this November and they won after 33 years of struggle. Stanley was up many a time in those years. I wanna dedicate this, not just to the ones who've won this, but for the remarkable number of those graduate teacher activists who reversed Stanley's trajectory, who went from graduate school to work in the labor movement, who are in the labor movement from Chicago to Arizona and a whole bunch of other places. So these remarks are dedicated to those folks. Uh, they know who they are. Uh, yeah. So I wanna continue this discussion of literature as a social knowledge by reconsidering that extraordinary book as a kind of proletarian literature, part of the rich and I think still unrecognized vein of worker narratives of the new left. Despite his own critique of the book, uh, and he actually saw it as kind of all sorts of limits. I thought I wouldn't go through all of that. One might see it as the first in a tetralogy of books on the labor movement that he went back to every decade, working class hero, a new strategy for labor, which was that self critique in 1993. 1998's From the Ashes of the Old, American Labor and America's Future, written out of the revival of the AFL CIO in the Sweeney election. Who the death and life of American labor in 2014 toward a new workers movement and to read that as a tetralogy would be a quite interesting thing, but I'm not going to do that. False promises stands on its own as a really extraordinary piece of writing. And so let me make one brief point about the kind of book it is, and then make three observations about the books inverted form, the ways its own gaps its own polyphonies, its own false promises, figure its enduring historical theoretical narrative of the shaping of what one might call America's history and class consciousness. First, a quick point on the kind of book false promises is. It never fit into the academy and its conflict of faculties. And still, it's a hard one to figure out where the hell you teach it. It's not really labor history in the modes of E.P. Thompson and Eric Hobsbawm and David Montgomery, another of my teachers there. Nor is it the industrial sociology or even the radical sociology of the labor process that we associate with a book that came soon after Harry Braverman's Great Labor and Monopoly Cap. It's not the kind of radical labor journalism of, say, Barbara Garson's great, The Electronic Sweatshop, uh, nor is it even a philosophical reflection of labor like those essays of the young Marcuse or Hannah Arendt. Rather, it's an anti-disciplinary book. Stanley probably thought of it as theory. There are several references in the book as to the task of theory, as if that was the task of this book, though no one ever thinks of it as theory in that way. It might be seen as a dialectical response to a book that he quite, he hated in one way, but quite liked, which was Selig Perlman's Theory of the Labor Movement of 1928, which actually was the kind of theoretical uh, summa of the Gomper's vision of the labor movement, a book that furiated and fascinated Stanley. And despite the oft uh, narrated new left break with what C. Wright Mills called the labor metaphysic, a story Stanley himself retold many times, or perhaps because of that break, the militants and intellectuals of the new left produced more powerful analyses of labor than I think one finds in the Fordist era of the mass CIO unions. 
you know, so just think of those new left thinkers and well, this will just try to quickly or whatever. From Andre Gortz and Turin and Robert Linton in France to Tronti and Negri in Italy, uh, 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 Della Rosa, uh, to Necton Klug in Germany, uh, the early Hannes, Walter Rodney's remarkable works of the late 80s there. Uh, the braver men that I mentioned, James Boggs's uh, papers from a, a worker's notebook. Uh, not to mention the two great figures that we've lost recently, and I think have not been thought together. Someday, if I had time enough or whatever, I'd love to write an essay on Barbara Ehrenreich and Mike Davis. Put those two together on class and workers in America and whatever. But for Day, consider this as a kind of imaginative novel, this remarkable new left thinking on labor. Uh, an imaginative work, a proletarian novel, if you will. Curiously, the book's historical theoretical narrative, new developments in working class life and labor, and the formation of the American working class is bracketed by two proletarian novels. The first is a contemporary and in the spirit of proletarian reportage in the midst of the worker uprisings of 1968 to 1972, he gives an account of the unrest at the General Motors assembly plant in Lordstown, Ohio, with its strikes, its slowdowns, and its sabotage that had brought national media attention. And his account weaves a polyphony of voices, Jerry, Joe, Charlie, Rabbit, Ed, Mary, Bob, Carl, Dave, the local president, Gary. They were all done the interviews actually as part of the making of a documentary film called Loose Bolts, which he was part of that team. I watched it, you can now get it on YouTube or whatever. Uh, and is interesting. And then if that's the beginning bracketing it, at the other end, evidence from his quote, personal experience of the unsilent 50s. It seems to come out of nowhere after 350 pages or something. Uh, where indeed a chronicle of struggles among some working class people as they were actually fought during his decade of working and living in the factories and neighborhoods of New York and New Jersey from 49 to 59, that story of being suspended from Brooklyn College for the sit-in is interwoven with his work in the small metal working shops as a lens grinder in a camera factory, as a drill press operator, and transferring among a half dozen jobs in order to talk about how important job transfers were in the steel, the driver Harris steel processing plant, as well as the daily life, no different from that of other young married working class people with Jane and their son, Michael, and the difficulties, one on the night shift, one on the day shift, speaking of the pursuit of sleep. One might take this extended chronicle apparently a digression from the book's overall arc as a microcosm of the whole. And I wanna do that on focus on three points. One point, the transformation of work and the working class, the shift from the blue collar to the white collar, from the factory to the office, from manufacturing goods to producing services, the rise of a middle manager of what he calls the professional servant class, as well as the white collar proletariat of state workers, clerical workers, technical workers. This is well established now. But by the time fall, but false promises predates the Aaron Wright's essays on the professional managerial class. It predates Braverman's labor and monopoly capital. It comes out simultaneously and challenges Daniel Bell's coming of the post-industrial society. Stanley rejects indeed, seeing this as a shift from one mode, industrial to another, post-industrial, writing of the curious dialectical inversions of the forms of labor. On the one hand, the industrialization 
of the labor processes in service work. But on the other hand, the way that continuous process production in manufacturing turned industrial work into service work, the care and maintenance of the machines, of the aptly named boring mill, a giant lathe, he writes in a passage that might be a modern Moby Dick, the machines move so excruciatingly slowly that operators sometimes sat for an eight hour shift watching the machine cut a single piece. The work was not physically exhausting, but incredibly boring because the operator had to keep his attention riveted to the machine, making sure it was lubricated with a milky white solution of oil and keep the waste material from interfering with the cutting. This was particularly true in the oil industry, the continuous process. And of course, he was on to organize in the oil with the oil chemical and atomic workers. I think of, and this is the end of my first point, I think of Stanley as Homer Simpson's organizer. You remember Homer at the nuclear plant watching the dials all day long. Second point, the book is not the making of the American working class. It's kind of the reverse of E.P. Thompson. The real subject of this book, with its double meaning of subject, is, he tells us, the attempt to delineate both objectively and subjectively the divisions within the working class. The divisions in workplaces, neighborhoods, and households of working class people by race, ethnicity, religion, gender, age, types of work. Unlike those other mass media accounts of Lordstown, the Lordstown account is structured by distinguishing the different groups of workers there and the polyphony of their voices, black and white and ethnic workers, the women who were a visible but tiny fraction of the assembly line for of course, the Lordstown, the self-described Lordstown hippies, the migrants from the South, a whole variety there. And here again, one sees the logic of inversion in this, the way the union becomes fundamental actually not to the workplace, but to everyday life because of the centrality of fringes of health and pensions, as well as the suburban union hall replacing the old urban tavern. And so it becomes a kind of place of this new suburban working class. And on the other hand to see, whoops, sorry about that, uh, the way in which, uh, oh, yes, no, 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 sorry. Uh, the cultures of dark daily life are acted out in the workplace. And he powerfully reads the connection, which I think is too often missed, inside working class communities, not only with the stresses in the neighborhoods, but between the ostensibly technical divisions of skill in the working ideal, working hierarchies, what he calls the ideology of skill. These divisions outside the workplace make the de-skilling that Harry Braverman was so powerfully to anatomize, not simply a de-skilling because of scientific management and Taylorism, but a form of racial and gender management through the racialization and gendering of the very categories of skill through the structures of training programs, the struggles over transfers, over job classifications, over seniority lists, and all of those details. It's a fascinating sense of actually the racialization and the gendering of that workplace. And third and finally, false promises is built on the dialectic of life and labor, everyday life and everyday work neighborhood struggles and workplace struggles, school battles and factory battles. Stanley's account of the unsilent 50s toggles back and forth between life and labor, culminating in two juxtaposed struggles. 
The narrative of six week wildcat strike at driver Harris in 1957 with his own little speech. It's a funny and self-conscious one, not unlike the Mike Gold thing there uh, in there, as well as a bar fight and him in a bar fight there. And his account uh, as department steward first coming there and the struggle in the Newark Clinton Hill Neighborhood Council to defeat an industrial park. And this microcosm of the book, microcosm of a book begins with the issue of working class childhood, with play and games, with the pursuit of sleep, and ends with the intertwining of spectator sports and life in the factory and the industrial tavern, playing the numbers in a place where the banker is also the union rep to his surprise. Those analyses of children's games, circle games, turn games, permission, may I games, role games, you might have forgot that's even in this book, as well as the centrality of games in adult games, spectator sports and voting, his notion of the passion of partisanship that structures play and friendship. I think of the David Harvey once wrote that Marx never talked about the starting the analysis of, of, of historical materialism from the birth of a working class child. This book begins from that story. And Stanley on games might be put right next to CLR James's famous book on cricket. In the dreams of the unsilent 50s and in the Lordstown 70s, there are only three escapes that can be imagined to get a liquor license and open a small tavern, to work hard and obediently and become a foreman, and for a tiny minority, he says, to get a union office and make unionism a career. The third path was Stanley's escape, itself a false promise, a story that is not told in false promises, but rather in the great, and I think too little, little read sequel to the unsilent 50s, the narrative essay when the new left was new that he wrote a decade later, but that's another story. Thank you very much. I do know that you've all noticed that Italy made their delivery and you're probably hungry. So the question is, do we... Okay, sounds good. Yeah, just a, another Mike Gold anecdote on with Stanley. Well, one thing Stanley told me about Mike Gold was uh, his genius as the editor of the uh, Daily Worker. I think Barbara knows this. Was that uh, it had a really good racing page? Again, <laughs> but we're back to conviviality. Uh, any questions, comments uh, for our panelists here? And for uh, Barbara, you're still with us. I am. Okay, any questions from the audience? If I had 20 minutes instead of 15. That's very important because you said,
And we all fight over this thing. You know, they love each other. Yeah, we might be so. But because neither one of you both of all three of you said what we're about his relationship with George identity. Well, can I have, I'm going to really dodge this in one way. Because, because you know, uh, because I, there were two figures that were absolutely central for me in actually coming to the left. And one of them was Michael Harrington. And when I read his autobiography, I could see an Irish Catholic boy ending up on the left. And so I identified with that. Stanley, actually, that's how I want to turn this, is that the remarkable thing about false promises is it has an extraordinary account better than it's been written by any Catholic intellectual of the meaning of Catholicism in working class consciousness and culture and whatever. And so there's, so the, it's actually, I think in a certain sense, that's where you're exactly right that his secularism was not secularism in the way that he had his finger on the pulse of this at the point where in that fight moment, he's able to say, wait a second, even though, I don't exactly think of myself as Jewish. I am Jewish. It's like the great line in that, an essay that anyone who hasn't read should read. Raymond Williams is you're a Marxist, saying, aren't you? Which is to say, he doesn't think of himself as a Marxist, except when someone says, you're a Marxist, aren't you? And, there, and it feels like that is that moment, right? You're a Jew, aren't you? And at that point, yes, he is or whatever. But the kind of sense of Stanley's, uh, sense of the power, the importance, the importance of the Jesuits in the labor movement as kind of the organic intellectuals of the other side of the CIO is really a very powerful one. So I'll leave it at that. And Paul, hello, the magnificent Certain members of his family did not agree. He didn't have actually his own name and um, his inheritance, my father, his own, his way, his inheritance and marrying his daughter. Uh, Irish chicks are from Harlem, Spanish Harlem. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah. Just come in and give me false promises. It seems to me one of the ways to get is. Granted, they all from the outset of the flat continents. How do you develop flat continents so it becomes as rich and deep as it? That to me is what it's about. And then it's centered on certain frames. You mentioned one about tax. It's about tax that's the, uh, it's like selling lottery tickets, which is kind of the result of the labor representative and that uh, work, workplace. So he sees the connection between that point and this. Maybe that's a trying to see the connection between mass culture and labor hierarchy and like each of the very primates. So to me, it's indicated this is how even mind is dead. That's that's why I think this is a book up there. Yeah. You say two things on that. One is, and one will be slightly an uh, argument or a disagreement with Barbara, but the first one is that. Uh, one of the remarkable things at the end of the unsilent 50s, he says, is that the possibility for him to be where he is, and one, all narrators are unreliable narrators, and I'm sure that Stanley is as unreliable as the best. But nonetheless, it's the way he tells it, is it was actually his distance from the left that actually ended up there, that he felt that in some ways that he had not been, and partly because the left that he was closest to at that point with the Labor Youth League had gone underground. And so he felt some distance from that underground left. And there's a kind of interesting thing of the weirdness of being outside the left, and then, which comes up in that later moment in the uh, when the new left was new, when all of a sudden he is part of a new left very consciously. And so there's this weird way that that's also the unleft 50s for Stanley, as opposed to the left 50s. The other way he tells it, and I think actually he would be saying, he spent the rest of his career trying to think about how one turns that consciousness. And he tried to teach in all of us or whatever. But the term that he uses in false consciousness that I've never thought, false promises that I never thought I'd noticed before is not function of 
false consciousness, but of class unconsciousness. And that's a very interesting phrase. It suggests a whole kind of almost psychological sense that this is not that because people are, are seeing things wrongly or don't see it, that it may be an active repression that will only come out at some other moment. I'm not sure, like any metaphor, whether any of them are, are the only metaphor we should have, but I would think that Stanley's metaphor of class unconsciousness might be one that is as useful as any of the other consciousness metaphors that we have. Any other thoughts, comments? Yeah. I wonder if uh, Peter Callas uh, might need to uh, uh, address the possibility that Gronowitz is virtually both, uh, both promises, might be a kind of uh, good guidebook to help eliminate the uh, polarization currently uh, uh, accelerating in American society generally and the uh, sharp remind of uh, a hard right in, in particular, because it seems to me that what he's saying, uh, uh, what a half century ago, uh, has a good deal of uh, at least uh, indirect uh, uh, application to our current uh, political situation. Yeah, Michael, yeah. Sonia. Yeah. I don't know how many enemies I'm going to make right at the moment, but why not? Um, I think the consistent misreading, even of the Trump phenomenon, is the inability, maybe our class unconscious, to recognize that a good part of Trumpism is decent reflection on the false promises delivered to the American working class. Does that make it clear where I am? Yeah. So um, it's that science and denial and almost persecution of uh, an idea about being sold out, about being discounted, about being used in a globalized economy for particular purposes, watching the country get sold off piece by piece by piece, um, not being able to establish uh, a, a consistent collective and protection of something. That's Trumpism. And yes, I can think of a way in which a book which moves me greatly. We hear this coming today in this extraordinary rich interpretation. Just re energize me from start to finish. I love that book um, because it did open that door to people's real experiences as working for the most desperately boring and difficult and crushing experiences of, of labor. Um, and then their collective power and how they begin to conceive of it and so on and so forth. Yeah, it burns me up that someone like Trump is taking this from me. Yeah. It just burns me to death. Yeah. Um, when there is a powerful left intellectual vision in this country and Stan stands at the very pinnacle of the fall. Michael. That was a little <laughs> So okay. uh, I, can you hear me? Yeah. I, have, I, have, I, I haven't I haven't been able to hear most of what's what's been said. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to get the voices through clearly. But I, I have a, a question um, about Stanley and um, where he's situated historically and politically. Um, what was his relationship with the organized communist movement when he? Who was growing up, I always sort of imagine him as being having been, you know, raised in the nest of the CP in some kind of way. I could be wrong about that. And um, also, what was his relationship to this? Is okay, so a huge question in a way, but to uh, postmodernism and the way in which postmodernism was, you know, deflecting things in a very sort of anti totality, anti totalitarian you know, kind of way. Um, and I think he was perfectly aware of the anti-communism involved in all of that, but yet it seemed to me that in like the crisis of historical materialism that he was embracing a lot of the sort of 
you know, micro politics of oppositional movements kind of politics. And I, I just wondered what what was for those of you who have studied his oeuvre and who knew him personally, um, what 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 was his what was his odyssey, and and how does it relate to these larger organizations and and, and movements that, you know, bookend his entire life? Is that too big a question or too naive a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, if I could turn to Michael, uh, Michael, do you want to come up? Yeah, please come up to the front because yeah, I can't. Thank, hear okay. Those. His relationship to the Communist Party was through the Jefferson School. That's where he was educated. He read Aristotle, Marx, you know, all the pre-Socratics. He loved telling that story. His, he claimed his only mentor was Harry Wells, a pragmatic philosopher. And that's the only person that he ever considered a teacher. You know, everybody else was in dialogical uh, engagement with him. So his relationship to the Communist Party, especially, the, uh, obviously, the U.S. Communist Party, was, uh, was always as someone both within, he called himself a boy Stalinist for a long time. You know, we were trying to figure out the titles for his memoir, and one would be, uh, you know, um, Bronx Tale. We do it movie-wise, and the second phase would be boy Stalinist before he goes on to the to the factory work. So anyway, uh, Barbara, it's a long story. I mean, we can have the conversation, uh, you know, at another time in a much deeper way, but he did have this relationship to the to Communist Party. I just want to say we, we have someone here from uh, Italy, Matteo, who's, you know, uh, knows uh, Tony Negre well and works with him, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I shouldn't say that publicly, but Stanley's book, False Promises, lived an underground existence in Italy during the 1970s. It was translated by Ferruccio Gambino. And, you know, so... Stanley had an internationalist uh, moment as well, you know, in this in this context. His relationship to postmodern, another very deep question. He did not deny Lyotard. He did not deny the post-structuralist uh, moment. You know, he read Derrida actively. He had conversations with Derrida vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the work of uh, Theodore Adorno's Negative Dialectics and told Derrida, everything in deconstruction is in the negative dialectic. Of course, Derrida says, of course, you know, yeah, and this was at Irvine back in the day. So again, you raise very good questions here. You know, he used to say, am I a Marxist? He says, I'm like Marx. No, I'm not a Marxist. You know, which Marx would reply when he was asked, are you a Marxist? Marx would say, no, <laughs> you know, in a sense. So, but there's a critique and uh, Cornell knows this well in the, uh, in the crisis of historical materialism of Marxology, the academic Marxism or Marxism of the chair took hold during the 1980s and 90s. Uh, considerably, and he had many, many antagonists with this, this, this thing. The Crisis in Historical Materialism, I want to say, is a book that tries to encounter multiple tendencies and going back to Bakhtin in the polyphonic way, in, in a sense. And this, to me, was always Stanley's openness and his ability to synthesize so many different tendencies and make them palpable without ever, again, selling out where he came from. So I, I don't know if this helps clarify. Cornell, yeah, 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 you wanna come up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the bibliographical essay in 1981, the end Christ in historical materialism, Stanley and Rosa Bader, who was the very target of ridicule and critique, he says the most important text written on Marx to critique a dialectical reason was your own Paul Sartre, exactly. 1960. Exactly. Now anybody who defended Sartre in the age of Foucault, there you go. Got either courage yeah. or a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. And he, he read the, the yeah, right. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Well, absolutely. In, in relation yes. to Marxist and Nazis, always. When it overlapped, it was rich. When they floated off in the space and right. all became big pictures and asymmetric relations and right. the labor market right. and, and the workplace became overlooked and obscure. Stanley came out in the name of Paul Porsche and Lukács. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. But am I going too far, Brother Mike? No, actually, could I just answer your question <laughs> by like, with, a line, with a line with with a line from quote. Stanley yeah. that actually happens in that archive, which I find right here. It's a heavy set young worker whom he knew from the hot mill who'd been drinking quite a bit. 
and he cracks him across the face. I mean, uh, Stanley, I tried to fight back my own rage because in the back of my mind, I understood his predicament. He was getting a lot of pressure from home and it probably hit me to release his own fears. But then it goes on and after that, there is the fight. But there's a sense even there, Stanley, uh, seeing that the pressure at home, the predicament, the drunk worker, the drunk worker actually gives the anti-Semitic slur, he says, in a whisper. He walks past and whispers him to it. So it's it's kind of like, yes, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> Still plugged up. Well, again, uh, let it not be said that we don't believe in conviviality here. I think we should uh, stop and go have something to eat. Thank you all for uh, coming.